So Jimmy Apples, a somewhat notorious account in the AI space, just posted this. DARPA Q&A November 2023. Another thing is that not all the frontiers are advancing at the same pace. Reinforcement learning is not going as fast as the transformer model. And he links this attachment here from DARPA.military.mil, which that's DARPA.mil. That is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So that's coming from them directly. Let's, so let's take a look at that. Here he continues the Gemini model, getting the planning piece integrated into the LLM. We are not sure. We lack full transparency. What is happening? Let's take a look. So this is DARPA Information Innovation Office, the Q&A. What is DARPA's interface between traditional hardware and artificial intelligence? So they're saying some of the programs are in fact already at the interface between software and hardware. Now I'll link this down below if you want to read it yourself. We're not going to go too deep into some of the stuff and just highlight the most important things. So another question is quantum computers are making progress. Cybersecurity is getting into a new area of quantum safe security. Is there any new plans or programs from the I2O, the Information Innovation Office, on cryptographic engineering modernization of cryptography for quantum safe security? They're saying they're not doing anything on quantum safe security. We do have the Quanet program, which is using quantum on making networking more secure. DSO has a number of efforts on quantum. DSO looks like an, is another part of DARPA, as far as I can tell, the Defense Sciences Office. So there's some pushback in terms of, they're talking about NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the Department of Defense, the NSA, and who to talk to about that. There's a question about the president's effective order and safe, secure, and trustworthy AI. Looks like there are restrictions on what it takes to work on a frontier model in the new document. The concern is people can use various frontier models to generate bioweapons, but they're still working on figuring out what how that's going to affect them. They're asking, how does DARPA maintain relevance when it's such a fast-paced progress in AI? And so here they're answering one area is by program structure, the AI cyber challenge. And so this is where we're getting a little bit more into the interesting bits. We've covered this briefly a number of months ago, I believe. It's a competition where we partner with large language models the companies that produce them, you know, such as Anthropic, Google, Microsoft, and OpenAI. Whoops. Okay. So where's, where's Meta? How come uh, Zuckerberg is not on this? Is it because they are a open source model? Yeah, but this is interesting. So Anthropic is, of course, Claude 3. That's the model released by Anthropic. You have Google and Gemini, right? And then you have kind of Microsoft and OpenAI that have sort of a union, some sort of a cooperation agreement. They're not one and the same, but definitely there's a big overlap. They tend to work on projects together, including that whole Stargate project with the supercomputers and some potential uh, fusion energy projects as well. And so they're saying as the capability advances, so too will the performers using them be able to leverage the advanced capability at the same time. That is one model. Another piece is that we will be keeping an eye on what is happening if the capability we are working on in the program becomes outmatched, we will stop the program and regenerate or do something else. So I'm reading this as, and it sounds like I need to learn a lot more about DARPA and how it plays with all the other big companies, what kind of AI projects it has. But I'm reading this as they're saying, if one of these companies like completely blows us out of the water, then we're going to either try again or just try something else. I mean, they're saying we're keeping these guys close. <laughs> you know, We're keeping an eye on them. These are the people we're interested in. They're close by. So we know what they're doing. And here's where we get to the other part. So another thing is that not all frontiers are advancing at the same pace. Reinforcement learning is not going as fast as the transformer model. So we've talked about this, for example, with Andre Carpathy that tried to build autonomous agents way back in the days before OpenAI, before he worked at Tesla by using reinforcement learning. He basically says that's kind of a dead end, or at least for some things. It's like, I think the example he gave, if you're trying to get a computer to go and book a flight for you online, but you can't really use reinforcement learning for that, right? Because that would require it to like randomly click on all the buttons and see which ones work. You need something that has a little bit more reasoning skills or whatever you want to call that. And so it seems like they're saying that the transformer model, kind of the, the thing that's behind these neural nets, that's behind GPT-4, it sounds like that's behind Sora, behind, I mean, pretty much everything here, Gemini, all the open source models, both LLMs and other models, that's kind of the transformer model. So it sounds like if I'm reading this correctly, they're saying, well, that model, that frontier is advancing much more rapidly than reinforcement learning. They're also saying the pace of the frontier models is slowing down a little bit, which that's interesting because, you know, we're kind of expecting these amazing things, but they're saying, well, the progress is slowing down a bit. A lot of the results that we are seeing right now include understanding what they are doing and what they are not doing. They're saying they haven't released GPT-5, so they're 
referring to OpenAI here. And they're saying they haven't even started training GPT-5 due to the slowdown in the release of the H100s due to the production problems at the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the TSMC. So this is the biggest company producing the chips. So Taiwan is the biggest producer of chips. TSMC is the biggest company in Taiwan producing the chips. So this is like the, the linchpin behind a, a lot of this AI hardware for, for NVIDIA, for a lot of other people. If this thing just poof and disappears, it's not like we would go back to the dark ages, but boy, would a lot of our tech take a big, big hit because we need computers or rather chips for everything. We need them in, in our cars, in our phones, in our in our dishwashers, in the drones and like everything. So they're saying, so we have a little bit of breathing space. So that's interesting. So they're almost saying because of these alleged slowdowns at OpenAI, they have some time to catch up. The Gemini model getting the planning piece integrated in the LLM we are not sure we lack full transparency. So there's a lot of uh, speculation on what that whole Q star leak out of um, OpenAI was, and we still don't know exactly what it is. We kind of know that yes, the leak was real. It was a real project, a re real research project. It was leaked. Sam Altman and others have confirmed it, but no one's talking about it. And so we don't know what it is. A lot of smart AI researchers that kind of know what they're talking about have suggested that this is a combination of two big ideas. One is the LMs, right? The transformer models, the GPT-4s. And the other piece is kind of the reinforcement learning piece. So this is what a lot of the deep mind technologies do, the superhuman chess playing AI, the superhuman AI that, that beats everybody at Go. There seems to be a lot of speculation that maybe sort of the next frontier, the next big breakthroughs that come in AI will come from a combination of those two things. The power of LLMs that are really good at like reasoning, but they can't really like think through a lot of different steps and then kind of review their plans. They kind of have that weakness. Whereas the chess playing AI, the goal playing AI can think through a million different combinations, kind of figure out what has the best sort of possible reward, right? Figure out kind of like what the best steps are and then trace its thoughts back and, and kind of plan. So this is what, and again, this is total speculation, but the planning piece that they're referring to here in the Gemini getting integrated in the LLM to me, I mean, based on everything we've seen, I, that's what that sounds like. I'd be pretty surprised if it wasn't because the Gemini model is of course, Google DeepMind. Google DeepMind, they're the people behind all the alpha, right? Alpha Fold, Alpha Go, and then they have many others like Alpha Coder. Like a lot of that is stemming from what can be referred to as the planning piece, right? So combining that with the LLM. I mean, in November of 2023, when the whole Q star leaked, we, we went deep into this, the LLM plus kind of the Gemini Alpha Go technology. So this sounds like it, but they're saying, well, we don't know. We lack full transparency if they did it or not. But and then they're saying, but there are large research pro problems that still need to be solved. Hearing people say we're just a little bit away from full artificial general intelligence, AGI, is a bit more optimistic than reality. Yikes. So that's uh, that's interesting. He's saying there's still things like the halting problem. So halting problem seems like it's a computer science conundrum that goes back to Alan Turing in 1936. It refers to the impossibility of creating a universal algorithm that can determine whether any given program when run with a specific input will eventually stop, as in halt, or continue running indefinitely, loop. And the halting problem has important implications in computer science as it helps us understand the limitations of algorithms and highlights the existence of problems that cannot be completely automated. This emphasizing the need for heuristics and approximations in complex problem solving scenarios. And then they continue listing some of the other problems that we have. We still have exponential things. We still need resources, right? I'm assuming hardware and other things. I think there are still going to be super hard problems that are not going to be fixed by scaling. And the follow-up question is, my question is, when you have, you might not have AGI. So let's say we don't have AGI. It's not human level general intelligence, but you might have a system that helps humans and everyone in this room to advance so quickly that before AGI comes, this apex where, not an apex, I'm missing, there's some commas missing here that makes this a little bit rare. Difficult to read. So he's saying this asymptotic growth where we are dealing with that constantly. So asymptotic growth is like, it's a function where like if you're approaching some limit, it goes to infinity. And so I'm having a little bit of a hard time parsing this question. I think this guy wanted to uh, sound smart and it lost some clarity. My understanding, he's saying, okay, so we don't have AGI. Isn't this still going to mean that we have this breakneck speed of progress? Isn't this still going to create this fast change that still is very difficult to predict? 
and the follow-up answer, so from DARPA, he's saying, we try very hard not to get in the way of what industry is going to do. We're trying to work to solve problems that industry isn't going to do tomorrow. So, you know, using their kind of government resources, they're going after important, hard problems that the tech industry maybe is unwilling to solve. Maybe it's not, doesn't have enough profit in it, or just is too complex. So they're working kind of outside of the things that places like Google and OpenAI and Microsoft. So outside of what they're shooting for, they're kind of working on problems that are important that are outside of that. So he's saying, we aren't planning to work on multimodal large language models because they, meaning, you know, the industry, the profit-seeking entities, they are going to do that sometime. We're not trying to work on incorporating new information into an LLM because they are going to do that as soon as they can. We are trying to work on things they won't they won't work on right away. It's so like one example that I think is interesting that I've heard kind of in this scenario is, you know, a lot of these AI models need data. And right now there's a big debate on where they're getting this data, right? Are they just kind of taking everybody's data without permission, right? Is that okay? Is that not okay? And actually the founder of an of uh, Stability AI kind of suggested that each nation has their own sort of data library that all of the AIs in that country or that culture, they can just go and train on that. It has all the cultural works, all the and all the data that you would need to train a model that anyone, if you wanted to create a, a model for that culture, like let's say you're building something in the US, the US would provide this database of all books and images and whatnot that you would need to train up that model, a high quality data set, right? Obviously, Microsoft or Google, they're, they're probably not going to do that. But having the government fund something like that might be beneficial to progress as a whole. Now, they're probably, now DARPA is probably not doing something like that. They're probably doing something a little bit more like weird and crazy and futuristic. But I think that's an example. So they continue, we haven't done this yet because we might do multi-level security because we think that is something the Department of Defense might care more about than industry would, right? Right, because it sounds like uh, OpenAI did have some research into you know, encryption and, and security and stuff like that. But, you know, that's not their main focus. They're saying maybe that is on the industry's roadmap, but in a further future time frame. The point here is basically without encryption, if there's some way to break encryption, I mean, as I understand it, all information will be visible. All our bank accounts, all our chats and texts and messaging. Like, I don't think you can have online banking or online shopping or <laughs> most of the things online that, ha that have to be even semi-secret just would not work. So they continue, I don't know what the right answers are, but the question of what are they going to do and in that time frame, what should we do is something we talk about all the time. Do we have pe perfect answers? No. But do we ask that question constantly? Yes. Next question is, you have been pointing out here today, code generated by AI systems is just going to increase in scope and scale in ways we can hardly imagine. How important is it to DARPA that the code gets verified for correct functionality and security properties? That's the thing that we've been noodling, he says. They're noodling it over. I've been noodling it over quite a bit. Clearly, companies are going to be working a lot on generating a lot of code. In one of my next videos, we're probably going to talk about some of the startups that I think it, it was Y Combinator that has announced uh, like 100 or so AI startups that are coming out of stealth. And a lot of them, a lot of them are working on code, on coding and programming, both generating code as well as testing and, and tons more stuff like that. So he continues, we are not so sure they are going to generate code that is high quality or care about generating code that is of high quality. Clearly generating proofs about code and generating specifications, specifications, codes, and proofs are all languages. Those are all in the wheelhouse of LLM. So large language models certainly seem like they would be able to do it. Tying them together could be hard. Definitely noodling over to trying to generate specification code and proofs that are checked. Then they give some uh, people to talk to for more information. There are tons of code on the web. A lot of it is not good code. I believe a study from five years ago from Stack Overflow uh, found that there's usually a good security answer to a question, but it's usually number 10. That means there are nine bad answers before the good answer. By the way, I think a lot of this does go back to this idea of having LLMs in a planning piece because, yeah, LLMs can spit out millions of lines of code. And if you test it and it throws an error, you can even say, hey, this is wrong, and it'll try again, right? So it's kind of like this thing that just spits out a lot of likely answers. But to really kind of supercharge that ability to make it really useful, it's got to be some sort of a, like a reflection or a planning piece that's getting that right is, is going to be the next big breakthrough. So question, what is DARPA specifically interested in related to protecting electrical power systems and their industrial control systems? So it looks like they did look into this a while ago. And the initial response from the power industry was like, yeah, we totally know how to cold start a power plant. This is a 
in our wheelhouse. We do this all the time from hurricanes and natural disasters. The way he's phrasing this, I'm guessing that's not the case. Let's see, the part was not so much in their wheelhouse. The part that wasn't in their wheelhouse was how do you do that when your sensors are lying to you? Which of course is completely in the wheelhouse of attackers who take over the output of sensors. There is a sci-fi book called Demon by Daniel Suarez about this kind of rogue AI. I mean, it was designed to do the damage that it was doing, but really interesting book. I believe it was, it was published in 2006. It's fascinating how many things it got correctly about what something like this could do, right? This idea of uh, what if a attacker, whether it's an AI system or just some sort of a hacker takes over the sensors. I mean, how do you do any of the stuff that you want to do when your sensors are lying to you? I thought that was kind of interesting. Great book, by the way, for those that are interested in such things. And so DARPA continues, I think the program was a success because we opened the eyes of the power industry of what a cyber attack would look like. He talks a little bit more about that particular effort, but then he goes back to this AI by CC. So the they call it the AI Cyber Challenge. So again, this is where they took these companies and they brought them to White House. They're working with the White House, with the government, and a lot of initiatives with large language models and code and hacking and stuff like that, cyber attacks, etc. So you're saying that this approach in this whole power plant cyber potential cybersecurity attacks is part of a larger effort of cyber infrastructure or infrastructure in general, which is that AI AI cyber challenge effort, which got launched at Black Hat in Las Vegas, which is, can we use AI-based tools to help automatically find and suggest repairs to open source software? He mentioned a paper that came out a few months ago saying that ChatGPT, just out of the box, was roughly as good as some tools that were made specifically for that, for finding and suggesting fixes to software. But in these tools, you know, a very common response was, I, I need more information. And with ChatGPT, you can ask, what information do you want? And then you can have a conversation with it. And so that ability to converse back and forth with it, well, it was able to find and fix substantially more, more problems. And so kind of based on that little insight, the, that's why they launched the AI Cyber Challenge. It focused on open source software. They partnered with Open Source Software Foundation. And so this is interesting. I have to look deeper into this. I guess there's Avril Haynes. There was a testimony that suggested that they had to find and fix bugs at scale really, really fast. Like, uh-oh. What was that testimony? Who is that person? So it looks like Avril Haynes is former United States Deputy Director of the CIA. And Avril Haynes, uh, I haven't watched that testimony. It sounds like she's going, hey guys, like for real, we need to make sure our cybersecurity is like super tight and like really fast, like for real. And I think this is the the testimony that they're referring to. So it's on C-SPAN, you can see it. I quickly kind of tried to go over it a little bit. This was March 11th, 2024, about global threats. So kind of like my understanding is this. So she's saying we, it seems like we do have a lot of weaknesses um, for a number of reasons. One, more and more of our data, like us as individuals, as, as companies, as communities, cities, et cetera, we're putting more and more stuff out there, more data. And as that's growing and also, you know, the world, uh, I think it's fair to say maybe is getting a little bit more hostile. There's a little bit more of a divide between the various nations. There's just a little bit more potential threats from all of that, right? I mean, if you kind of know what's surrounding the whole Taiwan, China, US, I mean, there's a lot of people that are legitimately scared about how that whole thing is going to come to pass, right? Because China wants Taiwan. They produce all the chips. There's tons of stuff happening there, right? US has a interest in Taiwan, obviously, right? US is slowly trying to build chips away from the Taiwanese shores. And there are better people than me that can explain stuff like this, what's happening. But my point, I think, from listening to people that know what they're talking about is like, there's a lot of risk there. There's a lot of potential conflict there. And so one of the things that she's saying in this testimony is that the rise of AI is also playing a role in the sense that all this data that before, yeah, it could be sensitive or maybe not so much like, right, if you post a couple of harmless things here and there, each individual piece of data wasn't sensitive, right? But with AI, with this ability to gather this data and then make certain predictions or an inference from it, all of a sudden, that's a whole different playing field, right? You know, if genomics, for example, right, if somebody posts their, you know, whatever, 23andMe results or whatever it is online, well, maybe that's not a big deal, but all that data in the aggregate, if you're able to run it through AI, potentially could reveal certain, I don't know, certain patterns that could be exploited. I mean, I mean, that could lead to some pretty scary stuff. So a lot of this stuff uh, is seemingly coming from, you know, that testimony and the idea that we have to find fixed bugs 
at scale, like everywhere in our software and our code, and do so really, really fast. Next question is, how seriously does DARPA consider the possibility of software being developed by AI? So this is a very interesting question, and this is in a lot of people's minds. In fact, a lot of videos recently have been covering, will software developers have a job in a couple of years or five years, 10 years, whatever, is that even a good thing to go into? And Sam Altman during his interview with Lex Friedman kind of said that, yeah, he believes that it's going to write really good software. Jensen Huang of NVIDIA is saying that, yeah, I mean, he had kind of a, a strong stance on it. Like, yeah, you're not going to need to learn how to code. And here the answer is that, yes, DARPA has a position on this topic. He's saying, my opinion is that will be a tool that will help people write software faster, which is true. This is certainly what we're seeing. A lot of people are saying that it's really helping develop how fast they're able to do stuff and particularly boring boilerplate software faster, but it will not automate the process. All right. So this is interesting. I mean, this is, uh, you know, DARPA, pretty smart folks over there saying that, no, they're not seeing, you know, code automation anytime soon, or perhaps even at all. And he's saying, I don't think that people who write good code will be out of a job anytime in the foreseeable future. He's saying, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but that seems inconceivable. Inconceivable. He continues, I think a lot of the boilerplate software, like coming in frameworks or something like that, the code everyone hates to write, I think AI will write it anyway in the near future. That is an interesting, interesting take. Next question. Can you give the office view of a minimum viable program MVP and how you think it's going to affect program size, complexity, and funding? So I'll skip this one, but if you're running tech startups, this is interesting because they kind of talk about how startups approach thinking about when to launch a product, the minimal viable product, how to test various hypotheses, etc. Again, I'll link this below if you want to read it. And then they continue with questions which PMs would be interested in ideas on computer vision. He's saying, well, I don't know if there's any specific people, but obviously it's a big part of certain problems. If you need to have autonomous systems operating in the real world, you they need to be able to perceive. Are there small business networking opportunities uh, as it relates to DARPA? And they're, you know, working on it, mentioning an event that's AI forward. It seems like that worked well. It looks like there's various programs like the Embedded Entrepreneurship Initiative. There's a focus on helping create companies. For people that maybe are not from the States or just not aware, like there's a lot of these government initiatives in the US that they kind of blur the line between government and in this case, you know, the tech sector. There's a lot of stuff where it's like, I mean, there's just a lot of like overlap and then some of this stuff is not too visible to outsiders, which certainly makes sense. I mean, if you have various spy agencies, they can't just be publishing all their secrets. All the big tech companies don't want to be publishing all their secrets. So, I mean, there's people that raise questions about if this is, you know, a good thing or not. And, uh, well, those people are never heard from again. I am totally kidding, but no, but legitimately I love DARPA. I do have, um, tons of respect for what they do. I, they've developed some really cool things that we all use and enjoy that might have not come about if they weren't there, or at least maybe would have been kind of corrupted and not, not as good as it was. I mean, they're behind the internet, right? So DARPA's ARPANET project in the 1960s laid the foundation for the modern internet. They're behind GPS, the global positioning system. So kind of that network of satellites that allows us to know where we are in the world. And, and you know, the whole world is, is using that. We're all benefiting from that technology, from the internet. They've pushed tons of things with stealth technology and autonomous vehicles, robotics, quantum computing. And the fact that they're now uh, looking into what needs to be done on the AI front is certainly exciting. I'm, I'm very excited about that. I made the joke about people disappearing and I got kind of scared. So, I mean, I, I love DARPA for real. And there's tons of more things that I think some of you would find highly, highly interesting. So again, I'll leave the link below. But to me, I think in terms of AI, I think we covered the most interesting little bits and pieces here. Overall, I mean, my big takeaways is one, I think the speculation about the combination of planning plus LLMs, transformers, kind of like the merging of those two things, because they were kind of separate sort of fields of study of AI progress, right? Reinforcement learning did a lot of cool stuff. It took us a long way, right? Then LLMs come out and it's kind of like this brand new thing, right? And now we're trying to take the strengths of each and kind of combine them. But he's also saying that this idea that we're just a little bit away from full artificial general intelligence, well, maybe not so much, right? So there's tons of problems that we still have to solve. And them saying this, like they haven't even really started training GPT-5. That's a weird thing to hear, right? That's a, that's very different than sort of the word on the street. Is. <laughs> but I mean, this is DARPA, this is the government, the military, they're working very closely with these companies. I mean, they do say here that they don't have, you know, 
full visibility into what's happening. But so as far as I can tell, this was released on November 13th, 2023. So I mean, if so if I'm reading everything correctly, they're saying as of November, they haven't started training GPT-5, which which uh, is surprising. But uh, with that said, let's uh, let's noodle this over a bit, you and I. Let me know in the comments what you think. If you think I'm wrong about something, if I missed something obvious, definitely let me know. Obviously, a lot of things here, take it with, I mean, I usually say take it with a grain of salt. This seems like a pretty, obviously, a legit resource. Now, maybe some of those things that they're saying, that's opinion. You know, he's saying, oh, yeah, like coding will not be automated. You know, maybe that's an opinion. But certainly, I think most people would agree that it's probably a very, very informed, very educated opinion, right? Certainly, there's a lot of weight behind it. But yeah, certainly this person is saying that all of the hype behind AI and a lot of the stuff that we think is going to happen, well, we're not quite there yet. The GPT here, the, the GPT-5 is not released. It's not being trained as of, you know, like, what, five months ago? But the pace of how the development of these frontier models, it's, it's slowing down. That automated coding is uh, not quite as realistic as one would think. But the potential for cybersecurity attacks it could be, and, and it is very real. So, wow, when I sum it up like that, it's actually quite, quite depressing. Also, how did Alan Turing just know everything from like the 1930s? How did he just like know everything there is about AI in 1936? Of course, his story, if you're not aware of it, is covered pretty well. Like, I enjoyed this movie, so this is called The Imitation Game, with Alan Turing, of course, played by uh, by a, a great actor whose name is, um, I want to say, Benadryl Cabbage Patch? Coverbund? I think that's it. Nailed it. But yeah, great movie. He plays Alan Turing and is very good at it. With that said, let me know what you thought of this. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.